Say what's cracking, YouTube? It's your boy, 16 to life, and I'm back like I'm on a pro violation. Y'all down. Now, for those of y'all that's new to my page, in 1994, I got arrested. I was eventually sentenced to 16 years plus life, and I served 24 years straight in the California prison system. During those times, I accumulated some good stories and insight on things related uh, pertaining to the California prison culture, and I'm going to share some with y'all today. If you happen to like the video, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to my channel, leave a comment, and most importantly, hit that notification bell. I've also been hearing a lot of people who had subscribed to my channel earlier say they no longer receive the notifications. So what you may have to do is unsubscribe, then subscribe again, and make sure you hit that bell that says off on notifications. Um, let's go. So for a long time since I've been doing my prison stories, I often would get comments in the section asking me, hey, chill, uh, tell us a story about the Northerners or, hey, chill, why don't you never speak about the Northerners? And so uh, the reason being is just because I never really done a whole lot of time um, with Northerners. Um, a lot of the prisons that I was at was down south and there weren't many Northerners uh, or wasn't any Northerners at all. Um, so when I first got to the pen, which was in 96, I hit Salinas. Now, there were a lot of Northerners up there, but when I first got there, I knew nothing about prison politics, none of that stuff. This was the first time that I had been to prison myself. So I had no idea that the Northern Hispanics, uh, the Southern Hispanics didn't get along and stuff like that. So uh, I'm really just trying to learn about what's expected of me and things like that. So, you know, um, I really didn't pay much attention to what other people had going on. Now, there were no Northerners there. There were some of them, of course, who played because we played basketball. We shared the side of the basketball court with the with the Northerners. And so, um, you know, I was cool with a few of them, but I don't quite remember who they were, or the names and this and that. But like I said, I'm just really trying to learn the politics, um, being young and stuff in prison. So um, uh, I do remember... I do remember a couple of times, and I don't know, uh, because there was also bulldogs on the yard. I got to uh, Salinas Valley like around, um, I want to say, late July, early August of 1996. And so there was a couple of times when some fights broke out on the yard. And I would see Hispanics running across the yard. And I till, to this day, I still don't know if that's maybe when the bulldogs had their split from the northerners. I, I don't quite know who was, who was fighting. Um, I do remember one time we were sitting in the chow hall at a table. It was me, my celly, Big Heron, Big H, also known as Big H from the Grandies. Not a lot of times when I say that, people will confuse that with the uh, with the Heron who who um, was connected with, I guess, with Sugar and those guys. No, this Big H, this was a Crip who had been down for about at that time already 16, 17 years. He was a Crip from Compton Grandies. He was at the table. It was another dude by the name of Miron, who was from 60s. Um, Miron had robbed the jewelry store or something like that and, and got and had got shot in the process. And, you know, he ended up having a life sentence, too. So anyway, these Hispanics at the table right in front of us, all of a sudden, they just boop, beep, beep, boop, bop, bop. They go to fight. And it's like a little three on three or whatever. Um, it was a guard. It was a guard in the tower, a black dude by the name of Collier. I can see his face right now. All of a sudden, he just shot the block gun. Boom, boom. Now, the block gun is, uh, now, when, when you're in, when you're in the, okay, so let me go back. When you're in, at Salinas, we didn't, the, Salinas was a 180. So, we didn't, when we went to feed, they didn't release us from the building like at, uh, regular prisons. And you come outside on the yard, you walk around the track, maybe, maybe, uh, I don't know, half a mile and go into another cafeteria at a, uh, Salinas at a 180. When you're in the building, they open this door, you go right through another building and the chow hall is connected right to the building. And so, you know, the chow hall was small. Uh, I don't know how many people could get up in there, maybe 30, 40 people, but the whole design of a 180 is to minimize having, uh, convicts in large crowds, you know, so, in the event something does happen, it'll be easier to control. And so when now we're sitting in the we're sitting in the chow hall. There's a um, there's an elevated tower. There's two elevated towers. One in front of us, 
one one behind us. And in there they have mini 14 rifles and they also have block guns but uh that shoot this hard wooden projectile. And um if they're if they don't see any weapons, then they're supposed to shoot the uh the block gun. And so the second they start fighting, uh call your said, get down, boom! He didn't even the words get down wasn't even out of his mouth. He shot the block gun. Of course he he shot and I'm I'm looking right at him. The block gun, I think, missed the uh the Hispanic dudes that was fighting, and one of them must have hit Miron in the chest. So we got everybody get on the ground and stuff. They come get the people who was fighting. And then uh so once they, you know, told us to get back up, resume normal program, Miron, he was mad. Like, man, these these motherfuckers, man, they're gonna have to start giving somebody a warning or letting somebody know something, man. You know, uh, this motherfucker just shot me, man. I'm I'm still shook up. Man, I, I I didn't know I thought it was over, you know, because like I said, he had done a robbery and he had got shot by the police. So I guess he still was shell shocked and, you know, suffering some PTSD from whatever he had went through, you know. And sometimes it's customary in the penitentiary that when one racial group is gonna remove somebody from from their, you know, from from the yard, who some somebody who's undesirable, they'll let the other races know and other collections and factions know, so they won't be in the vicinity and get caught up in what's going on. This this at that point in time didn't happen. So for whatever reason, like I said, he was shot, he was upset, he was shook up, you know. And so I I don't know, like I said, I don't know if if who was fighting, if it was the bulldog, if if it was the northerners or whatever. And so uh, I stayed there a few years. And then I moved on down to Ironwood. Now, when I get down to Ironwood, Ironwood is in Blythe, California, down south. And like I said, by me going to prison for the first time, I had no idea that the Southerners and the Northerners didn't get along and all these, you know, so learning all this stuff is new to me. Um, so I stayed in Ironwood for about six years. And then I moved, um, I ended up getting moved up to Corcoran, Sat F, which was a level two. Uh, now, they did have some Northerners there. But the northerners there were not on the particular yard that I was on. This uh, particular prison, Corcoran Sat F, also had two yards that was designated for uh, people who had substance abuse issues. And they did have some northerners over there. Um, when I was at Corcoran, and this is just my personal feeling, my personal opinion, because Cor Corcoran, I think it might be considered up north or somewhere close to the up north starting point. Um, but Corcoran... Uh, the officers up there, you had some officers, in my opinion, they didn't like the Southerners. So I don't know if they sided more with the uh, if they sided more with with um, if they sided more with the Northerners or whatever. But like I said, to me, some of them definitely was biased and uh, towards some some of the Southerners. So later on, while I was up there, I end up going to the hole for um, I got charged with stabbing somebody and they had they had some Northerners in the hole. Now, by this time, I've been in prison uh maybe about six seven eight years somewhere around there whatever it was so now i'm more knowledgeable about the politics between the north and the south um one day a dude is so when i'm fresh in the hole a dude is walking past my cell now when i first got to prison the northerners would to uh to to be noticeable and different from the southerners the southerners all had bald heads the Northerners had a little hair up on the top, and I believe they had like a little flat top, maybe. And so, you know, I guess maybe if something was to, to break out between the two, that way they could distinguish who's who. So, um, my celly had a bald head. He walked next door. To, he walked next, my, excuse me, my next door neighbor. He walked, he came out of the shower. He seen me looking out the window. He said, what's up? I nodded, what's up? He went right next door. So then he got, he got up, and you can talk through the vent. He started talking to me through the vent and explaining that uh you know he told me his name and blah 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 then he told me that he was a northerner which surprised me because i had been used to seeing northerners like i said with the uh with uh you know with some type of like the small little flat top or whatever but no he explained that he was a northerner and you know he had heard me speaking swahili over the tears so he wanted me to uh, teach him a little swahili and stuff like that and so uh we started doing that. You know, I was sending some words and stuff like that. But also there was another northerner in there. Well, there were several northerners in there, but there was another northerner. In there. I can't remember his name. And what kind of um, surprised me, it was a southerner in there. And, and and they was real cool. You know, the southerner and the northerner, because like I say, I'd always heard stories about the hostilities between the two factions. But 
the Southerner, you know, they was real respectful toward both of them was respectful. They talk, laugh and clown. And even the Southerner, after he let his homeboys read it, he would get a lot of books sent in to him from his from his family and friends. I guess he would send the books down there to let the Northerners read, which I thought was cool, because, like I said, I don't. I always heard stories how they opposed each other, but they was both real respectful. And so one day it came time for the northerner dude to be released. And so the northerner was going back to the two yard and he said, hey, man, you know, I'll probably be right back. You know, so they released him in the morning, whatever time it was, maybe nine, ten. And sure enough, man, around five or six o'clock, he comes he comes walking back up in there. So, uh, you know, he's laughing. He said, hey, yeah, I'm back and all this type of stuff. So. The Southerner, who was sending him the magazines, asked him, hey, what's up, man? What happened? He said, oh, man, you know, I got into it with your um, with your people. So he went to explaining that he got put back on the yard where he had came from or whatever. And their numbers over there was extremely low. You know, it may have only been five or six of them. They I think they all let him out of the hole and sent them to this building. So when they get to the building um, and the building was dorm living. He said at some point in time, the Southerners pushed up on him and told him, you know, they they had to get up out of there and not of respect. They was going to give them like an hour or something to roll it up or something. You know, and he said, of course, you know, they told him, hey, man, we ain't we ain't doing no rolling up. So, you know, it is what it is or whatever. So eventually the uh, the Southerners rushed them. You know, they got to fighting and, uh, you know, the police came over there, separated them, made them, broke them up and then brought them back to the hole. So, you know, um, his spirits was upbeat, you know, at no at no at at. At no time was he being disrespectful to, towards the Southerners and vice versa, who was in the hole, you know. And that's something that I, that I really respected because I've never believed in, you know, woofing, talking shit uh, behind closed cell doors and this and that. You know, to me, his mentality was he knew that as a Northerner, you know, they got into it with the Southerners. That's something that he expected. It was what it was. And, you know, he wouldn't be disrespectful. If need be, he'd handle his business when the time came. But outside of that, you know, no need to be disrespectful. Everybody was back there doing time or whatever, whatever. Um, so then later on, you know, I end up leaving and stuff. Uh, eventually, I got to CMC West. Now, when I got to CMC West, they had um, a bunch of Northerners there. You know, they had a bunch of Northerners there. When I got to CMC West, it was like around 2000, I, I would like to say, 17 2018 so by this time i'm there for a while and then they they're having talks about the you know that's when the end the hostilities uh movement came along between you know between the northerners and the southerners and all that type of stuff you know they started letting a lot of those guys out of the hole who had those indeterminate shoes and so there was peace between them and so uh now that's the time during that little maybe year and a half two years i was there uh, that's the most time that I'd done around Northerners. So um, to me, by then, it didn't seem like um, the Northerners and the blacks, it didn't seem like we had that bond that I once heard about, you know, um, that was between the two. Like we was allies, you know, it was just we'd speak to each other. It was cool and stuff. But, you know, throughout the years, you've had some instances where Northerners and blacks have got into it. So maybe that played a part in into weakening the bond or whatever. I don't quite know, like I said, because at this time, this is the most time that I've ever done around Northerners. From what I did see of them, they were, you know, um, definitely militant. Um, they had, you know, a couple of workout areas that they claimed as their own. They would always keep security on that. You know, they would have, um, you know, if, if they had dudes over there working out, you'd always have two or three dudes on the perimeter, you know, making sure that, um, you just couldn't run in there and, you know, possibly try to attack some of them. They was respectful. You know, they was cool. It was a lot of youngsters there, though. You know, it was a whole lot of youngsters. You had a um, couple of older dudes, you know. Um, and so it seemed like, you know, of course, they was coming there, um, falling up under the structure and, and conforming to the structure. But for the most part, that's the most time that I've ever done around Northerners, like I say. So that's mainly and, and why I never speak about, you know, the Northerners, because I didn't do any time uh around them it doesn't have to do that you know i have a problem with them or or anything of that sort you know the, the main the main and only reason is i just never done much time with them so you know that's why i don't uh speak about the northerners because i have really nothing to say so anyway that's my little video today man i always get a lot of questions you know so shout out to the northerners man um uh much respect you already know what it is it's your boy 16 to life resume normal program